Sarah McGregor, and I am here to introduce our presenters today. Today we're going to be talking about how the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act impacts tax-exempt, not-for-profit organizations, and uh, pretty, pretty dramatically. Today, Amanda Adams, who is a managing director with our firm and our national leader for nonprofit tax services, will be speaking along with Rachel Gibbons. She is a manager in our nonprofit tax services. Both are very experienced and have a wealth of information on this and have been closely watching uh, what's come out of this new bill, and it's pretty extraordinary. So today we've got quite the agenda talking about uh, provisions that will impact charitable giving, uh, affecting uh, employees and how that may happen, what's new with unrelated taxable business income, some other areas that were also thrown in, and give you some ideas about what next steps you should take. So with such a full agenda, uh, let's go ahead and Amanda, I'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, provisions that are going to impact charitable giving. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the impact on exempt organizations of recently enacted tax reform. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act creates new compliance requirements, additional taxes, and potential stress to the operations of not-for-profit organizations. Today, Rachel Gibbons and I will explore the various changes affecting not-for-profit organizations, including updates to unrelated business taxable income calculations and issues affecting the deductibility of charitable contributions. Fortunately, there were a number of proposed items that didn't make it into the final legislation, such as the repeal of the exclusion from taxable income for qualified tuition reduction, a limitation on the exclusion for employer-provided housing, and termination of the new markets tax credit. For the provisions that remain, there may be a cause for concern that implementation will be difficult due to the rushed nature of the legislation and the potential changes due to future technical corrections and or additional guidance issued by the IRS in months or years from now. As you know, most exempt organizations rely heavily on contributions from donors, and research shows that the largest percentage of donations comes from individuals. So first we wanted to start by taking a look at the impact the new act has on individual taxpayers, especially with respect to charitable giving. First of all, the current seven tax bracket system is retained, but the rates are lowered for all taxpayers and thresholds are adjusted. Um, we have a slide in here that shows a comparison of the 2017 tax rates and brackets to 2018, just as an example. The standard deduction has essentially been doubled as follows, married filing jointly up to 24,000, head of household 18,000, all other taxpayers are at 12,000. Personal exemptions have been eliminated and the state and local tax deduction is now limited to $10,000. That includes state income taxes, property taxes, sales and use taxes, et cetera. So the impact that this has on individual taxpayers actually being able to itemize deductions with the higher standard deduction is extremely limited. It's expected to reduce the number of people who will itemize deductions to only 5% of taxpayers, thereby removing the tax incentive for charitable giving for 95% of taxpayers. It's important to remember that the new federal tax law does not affect the way nonprofits acknowledge contributions. This means that they should continue to provide donors with gift acknowledgments, even those donors who do not itemize and therefore will not need to substantiate their gifts will still expect to receive a thank you from nonprofits to acknowledge their gifts. Additionally, since you won't know which donors will be able to itemize and which won't, you should continue as before. Another important change is the increase of the exemption for estate and gift taxes up to $11.2 million per taxpayer, and that figure is indexed annually for inflation. This is a temporary increase, um, essentially between 2018 and 2025. Um, as you know, many individuals would create private foundations and charitable trusts as a way of mitigating estate and gift taxes, so it's possible that this increased exemption may result in a decrease in the formation of those types of charitable entities. Let's focus on a couple of positive changes with respect to charitable contributions and itemized deductions. One is that for the largest donors, 
the limitation for cash contributions to public charities has been increased from 50% of adjusted gross income to 60%. So for the largest contributors, they're now going to have an incentive to give more um, because of that limitation increase. Kind of an unusual item, the removal of substantiation exception for certain contributions reported by the charity. Essentially, there was a provision in the code section that would allow for individual taxpayers not to have a tax receipt to, to substantiate their gift if the charitable organization filed a return um, that reported the same information as the tax receipt. A few years ago, they tried to reinstate kind of development of this form, but there was such a backlash against it um, that the, essentially it was determined that charities and donors didn't want to have charities filing 1099-like forms that would report the donor's social security number, et cetera. So essentially this provision is just a, removable, a removal of that option that was never carried out. And lastly, the overall limitation on itemized deductions was repealed temporarily. So essentially what this did was it reduced certain itemized deductions by the lesser of 3% of income over a threshold or by 80% of total deductions. So essentially itemized deductions could have been limited for the higher income taxpayers who were subject to that threshold. In 1984, the IRS issued Revenue Ruling 84-132, which raised questions about the deductibility of any contribution tied into collegiate ticket purchases. In an effort to clarify, distinguish, and supersede this ruling, the IRS issued a new ruling, 86-63, which allowed payments made in facilities which were not sold out to be deducted as a charitable contribution. This created chaos since each institution would have been faced with the need to analyze every purchase for every game and every seat. As you can imagine, that would have been an administrative nightmare. On the very day that the 1986 revenue ruling was issued, legislation was introduced in the Senate and shortly thereafter in the House to roll it back. Unfortunately, neither of these were incorporated into the new tax law. However, in last minute activity, the members of the conference adopted some transition rules allowing for special unique treatment on specific issues to meet requests of specific conferees. So Section 1608 of the 1986 Tax Reform Act was adopted, granting relief from the 86-63 ruling for, and only for, Louisiana State University and the University of Texas. Stories appeared all over the nation about special treatment for the universities and ensured this would be a topic that wouldn't die. The very next year, legislation was introduced to repeal the revenue ruling and was incorporated in the Technical Corrections and Miscellaneous Revenue Act of 1988, new code section 170L, which permitted for treatment as a charitable contribution of 80% of a payment made in exchange for the right to purchase seating in the college's athletic stadium. It was made retroactive to 1983. So why the change? The general rule is that when a taxpayer receives or expects to receive a substantial return benefit for a payment to charity, the payment is not deductible as a contribution. Previous law generously estimated the value of the right to buy tickets as 20% of the payment made. Clearly, they've reassessed that viewpoint. What is still unknown is whether the point systems used by many schools to determine the location of tickets and the contributions tied to points will remain deductible. Preston Questenberry, formerly a technical reviewer in the IRS Exempt Organization Division, recently stated that in his initial conversations with IRS officials, they appear more inclined to argue that the points received in exchange for contributions are tied to the right to purchase seats and are therefore non-deductible. However, he believes this is not necessarily settled and encourages institutions who feel strongly that points contributions should be treated differently to weigh in with Treasury and the IRS. If such contributions were previously treated as being subject to the 80-20 rule versus being fully de deductible, it may be difficult to argue that they should be fully deductible now and vice versa. Another item to consider is whether payments that are no longer treated as contributions are now subject to sales taxes since they are related to the purchase or sale of tickets. Whether the sale of tickets is currently taxable will likely be the key. 
So what is the overall impact to charitable giving? We have some positives and negatives. Um, bringing, uh, bringing up the negative list is doubling the standard deduction, capping the state and local tax deduction at $10,000, doubling the estate tax exemption, repealing the deduction for athletic event seating rights. An unknown is lower taxes. Some argue that when individuals have more take-home pay, that they could use that take-home pay to make contributions or support charitable organizations uh, with that extra income. On the other hand, we have people arguing that um, if the incentive for having a tax deduction is taken away, that charitable giving will decrease. Positives um, are repealing the peace limitation and increasing the AGI limit for certain contributions. Um, again, it's hard to say what's going to happen, um, but there are many people that have cause for concern that donations will significantly be impacted by these new rules. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel to talk about items affecting not-for-profits with employees. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I just wanted to hit a few highlights of some of the changes to fringe benefits that are going to impact nonprofits. And really, this didn't didn't really segregate out nonprofits. It's really just trying to put the nonprofit community on the same playing field that for-profit entities would experience with respect to how they treat, treat certain fringe benefits that they pay to their employees. And so three of these that got targeted for the nonprofit sector anyway, um, as far as having to treat it as unrelated business taxable income, were qualified transportation fringe benefits, parking facilities used in connection with a qualified parking facility, and also any on-premises athletic facilities. So this next slide really just shows kind of what falls under the qualified transportation benefit. So previously, um, employees could contribute on a pre-tax basis to um, like a qualified plan that would allow them to do, um, have qualified transportation on a pre-tax basis. Employers often would contribute or just pay um, a subsidy for employee parking and related transit costs. And all of that was done on a pre-tax basis. But with the new tax reform, um, employers are no longer eligible to receive a deduction for that. And so in the for-profit world, um, if you still continue to provide these benefits to your employees on a tax-free basis, when you file your corporate tax return, you're not going to get a deduction for those expenses. So to level the playing field, the flip side of that for the nonprofit sector was, okay, you're not taking a tax deduction because you're filing a 990 if you don't have any unrelated business income tax. It's never hitting it. You're not losing the benefit of that deduction, but your employees aren't picking it up as taxable income. So what they decided was they were going to make the nonprofit sector, if they continued to pay those benefits on a pre-tax basis for their employees, that they were then going to have to pay unrelated business income tax on that. It makes it a little bit harder for the nonprofit sector in the fact that um, there are a lot of nonprofits that don't have any unrelated business income tax liability, so they have not historically filed the Form 990-T, which is where that tax would be assessed. And so it creates an additional filing compliance. I think from a practical matter, um, employees are just going to have to review the cost of what those benefits are. Is it going to be worth it to file a 990-T to pick up those um, now taxable fringe benefits? Or are you just going to revamp how you pay those benefits out? For example, are you going to just increase your employees' pay and kind of let them pick up the additional tax liability on it? If you're going to pay for it before, you're just going to tra transfer it to them in some way to compensate them but make it taxable income to your employee. Um, I know some companies may look at, depending on the dollar volume involved, uh, may look at establishing a, a pre-tax plan where their employees are contributing to it and, and just kind of changing the mechanics of how they that do that plan. So I don't expect major changes with respect to the benefits offered so much as employers really looking at how do we want to give our employees the same level of benefits that we have historically while making it easy on us from a tax compliance standpoint but not overly penalizing our employees. Uh, some companies, I think, you know, for on the for-profit side, they'll just continue to offer the deduction as they have in the past and just forgo the benefit. Um, it's it, there's, you know, there's a tax implication, and then you can't just let the tax implications drive everything. You also have to think about, you know, employee retention and employee morale and things like that, depending on the volume of the benefit. So, um, but it's just a little bit more of a headache in the nonprofit sector because you've got an extra form filing that you may not have had historically. We'll have to see um, how the IRS also revises the Form 990-T to even allow us to report this information. 
The other one was on-premises athletic facilities. So some organizations have just on-site athletic facilities that their employees or maybe employees and family members can use, and that historically has been excluded from taxing employees on the basis it was just an additional fringe benefit that was covered under the code. But again, in the for-profit world, this is no longer going to be allowed on a tax-free basis. So to flip it out, again, on the nonprofit side, it's going to be a potential UBIT item for nonprofit organizations. Um, I think one thing, if you have something like this on, on site, you just want to make sure that it does fall under this code section. There are um, a lot of different exclusions in the fringe benefit world for payroll tax purposes, and some of them um, may overlap some. So there may be instances where you have certain benefits that you're providing your employees that you might think fall under this exclusion, but it might actually fall under you know, another exclusion that you may be able to find, um, for example, like no additional cost services or, or something along those lines. You really have to look at the, what really gave you the initial exclusion for payroll tax reporting purposes to begin with, and then how, you know, are there other provisions that you might be able to work with. But, but again, just to make you aware that is now on the table. And then there were also some certain other benefits that were now taxable. The changes were brought about as a result of the tax reform to employee achievement awards. This wasn't a major change so much, I think, as it was just kind of defining um, the exclusion as to if we're going to be able to exclude tangible personal property because it qualifies under the employee achievement awards. Um, the, the new regulations really just specify what is not tangible personal property. So if you're giving cash or gift cards or meals or vacations, what the IRS would consider basically cash equivalents, um, those need to be included in taxable wages. So it really is just kind of giving more guidance as to what would and wouldn't qualify under the existing exclusions. And then, you know, this is going to impact, the next one is on qualified moving expense reimbursements. So if you're trying to recruit somebody and then historically you've paid for um, all their moving costs, that historically was, um, pre, you could do it on a pre-tax basis if you structured it correctly. And now the, that item is going to be taxable income to the employee, which just makes it a little bit harder, I think, from an incentive program where you're trying to recruit talent when they're thinking about additional cap, you know, costs of, of that move. And, you know, I mean, again, employers are just going to have to look at how do we work around and get the employee here on the same basis. So maybe there's some type of gross up to help cover what the tax benefit would that be. Again, taxable, but just having to look at your current employee benefits and how they're operated to see if you can offer the same type of benefits, but you just have, we're going to have to get a little bit more creative about how we structure things um, so that we can get you know, the best bang for our buck and get our employees still the same level of benefits that they've become accustomed to. There is a new 21% um, tax on excessive compensation. So again, this, this really kind of mirrors what's going on in the for-profit world historically and for a C corporation paying. Um, compensation over a million, that excess compensation wasn't deductible. It kind of just pushes that out into the nonprofit sector. Um, those who have been in the nonprofit sector for a while know that there are already um, different regulations and rules that are pretty punitive on offering excessive compensation to officers and key employees, insiders of the organization, where if compensation was deemed unreasonable, the actual recipient of that compensation could be penalized. This kind of flips it on the nonprofit side to say, if we have compensation paid to uh, top highest, five highest paid employees, that compensation, the excess over the one million mark is now going to be taxable. That 21% is the, the new corporate tax rate. Um, I, I will say that this is going to apply to a, a very small number of organizations in the nonprofit sector. I think in an article I read, it said maybe like 2,700 um, out of like 14 million was this going to impact. So again, for, for most nonprofit organizations, this is not going to come into play, but, um, but there will be some that, you know, will have to deal with this. And this, this also just covers, in addition to compensation, there's also a provision to, to hit the same tax rate on um, excess parachute payments after an employee um, separates service that has different payouts um, as part of that severance. Those could also be triggered. And Amanda, I'm going to switch it over to you on the new items affecting unrelated business taxable income. Thank you, Rachel. So as you know, exempt organizations can be formed either as a nonprofit corporation or as a trust. Um, and so their unrelated business taxable income is taxed depending on the tax rate applicable to the entity type that they have. The changes to the tax rates are essentially that the corporate tax rate, um, instead of having a graduated 
rate with brackets, there is a single rate now of 21%. We can see on the next slide we've got a comparison of 2017. We previously had multiple brackets with multiple rates. For 2018, there is a single rate on all income. For trust, the graduated system still is applicable, but the maximum rate is now 37% as opposed to 39.6%. As you can see, smaller nonprofit corporations with UBTI of less than $90,000 will actually see an increase in tax from UBI activities because of the imposition of the 21% rate, where previously they may have been paying at the 15% rate. Another important change is the repeal of the corporate alternative minimum tax. That was applicable to certain larger exempt organizations that had significant unrelated business taxable income or uh, net operating losses that affected the calculation of their alternative minimum tax. So that is another a positive in terms of calculating unrelated business taxable income. <coughs> There's a significant change to net operating losses. Number one, the net operating loss of a nonprofit organization, the deduction will now be limited to 80% of taxable income. And this is effective for net operating losses generated in tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017. So any existing net operating losses that were generated in years prior to this time will be allowed at the full amount. So this new limitation of 80% will only be effective on new net operating losses generated in tax years beginning after December 31, 2017. Another major change to net operating losses is that previously they were carried back two years and then forward 20 years. Now you could make an election to forego the carry back period of two years. Now net operating losses will not be eligible to be carried back but will be carried forward indefinitely. You'll notice that there's a difference in the tax years that are, this change affects. This affects net operating losses generated in tax years ending after December 31st, 2017. So if we were looking at a June year-end organization, the change to the 80% threshold would be effective for the year July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019. The change to the carry forward, carry back issue is going to be effective for the July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2018 year. Now, the interesting thing is that the conference report, which is where they were trying to compare the House's version and the Senate's version and to decide on the final provision, that report indicated that both changes would be effective for years beginning after December 31, 2017. But for some reason, the actual legislation and amended code refer to the change happening for years ending after December 31. So for now, we have to assume that that is what the provision is going to be, but it's possible that if this was an uh, unintended result, that there could be a technical correction. Next, there are some changes to deductions. Essentially, this comes from the for-profit world, but is, of course, applicable to the 990T filers that are reporting taxable income. One is that there is a new deduction for qualified business income under Section 199A. This is applicable to trusts only, not corporations. This is a temporary deduction that is generally equal to 20% of qualified business income, which has a very specific definition, uh, too technical to get into here, but essentially it is not investment income. It is domestic source. Certain services are excluded from the type of income that can be qualified business income. You, an organization could get qualified business income through an investment in a partnership, S corporation, or publicly traded partnership, but it would have to be business income to qualify for this deduction. The next item that could be a positive is that there has been increased 
ability to expense certain business assets. First of all, assets purchased after September 27, 2017, certain assets are eligible for bonus depreciation, which is equal to 100% of the cost of acquiring the asset. Also, under Section 179, which is an election to expense certain depreciable assets, there's been an increase in the total allowable amount to $1 million per year. There are some caveats. It would be limited to income. It has to be tangible property. And the 179 election doesn't apply to trust. So for organizations that have significant unrelated business taxable income from an activity that has depreciation expense tied to it, it's possible that there could be some additional deductions as a result of these changes. The next change I want to talk about is the new requirement that unrelated business taxable income be tracked by activity. Until, <clears throat> until regulations and administrative guidance are issued on distinguishing and disaggregating activities when required, organizations can glean insights from the IRS's 2013 Colleges and Universities Compliance Projects. Findings regarding UBI practices from among 400 institutions surveyed and 34 audited perhaps laid the groundwork for the current addition to Internal Revenue Code Section 512A. UBI examinations resulted in increases to UBTI for 90% of the colleges and universities examined. Nearly 70% of examined organizations reported losses from activities where the organization failed to show a profit motive. Disallowance of more than $170 million in NOLs amounting to more than $60 million in assessed taxes. In addition, expense deductions were disallowed on more than 60% of the 990Ts examined because they were based on improper allocations between exempt and unrelated business activities. Exempt organizations should consider the following questions regarding any current or planned UBI activities. Is the trade or business activity appropriately defined, or might it be reasonably viewed as comprising more than one activity? If a particular trade or business has a history of recurring losses, is it supportable as an activity engaged in for profit? For purposes of Section 513, the term trade or business has the same meaning it does in Section 162 and generally includes an activity carried on for the production of income from the sale of goods or performance of services. The regulations under Section 183 relating to the disallowance of losses by individuals and S corporations from activities not engaged in for profit provide helpful insight as to the type of factors the IRS might use in issuing guidance as to the extent an activity comprised of more than one undertaking may be properly classified as a single trade or business. Those factors include the degree of organizational and economic interrelationship of various undertakings, the business purpose, which is or might be served by carrying on the various undertakings separately or together in a trader business or investment setting, and the similarity of various undertakings. The following criteria from the passive loss requirements under Section 469 are also helpful. Similarities and differences in types of trades or businesses, extent of common control, extent of common ownership, geographical location, and interdependencies between or among activities. The most common reason for disallowance of current year losses and net operating loss carry forwards in the college and universities compliance project was that claimed losses were connected with an activity for which the school lacked a profit motive, as evidenced by years of sustained losses. The regulations under Section 183 provide the following characteristics of an activity engaged in for profit. The activity is carried on in a business-like manner. Accurate and complete books are, and records are kept. Activity is carried on in a manner similar to like profitable activities. New methods to improve profitability are adopted. Taxpayer or advisors hold sufficient expertise. Advanced study of activity was conducted. Significant time and effort is expended. There's an expectation of increase in the value of assets used in a trader business. 
success in carrying on similar or dissimilar activities, the actual history of profit and loss for the activity, considering losses that may have been sustained for reasons beyond the taxpayer's control, profits earned relative to cumulative losses and investment in activity, dependence on income from the activity, and the reasons for entering the activity all indicate profit motive. So essentially now organizations will need to be able to track on a trader business basis the unrelated business taxable income or loss. So characteristics to consider will be how are those trades or businesses going to be defined and making sure that in segregating different trades or businesses that you identify those which have a profit motive and those which don't. So one other thing to reiterate is that this requirement to track by activity will be effective for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017. So for our June 30 year-end organizations, that will be the fiscal year ending June 30, 2019. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel to cover some additional items affecting exempt organizations under the new Act. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I did want to point out a couple of things on the slides. Amanda was talking about some things that we had just talked about internally as far as from a practical perspective, considering the need um, to look at kind of siloing your activities and looking at um, activities on a segment-by-segment uh, segment basis. Even though the implementation for our fiscal year filers is going to be out a little bit, and even our calendar year filers, uh, we've got a little bit of lag time. We have to be looking at now. Um, I know I have a lot of clients that have historically had losses, but when you start um, separating those out on an activity-by-activity -activity basis, you're running into a situation where you may not have historically budgeted for unrelated business income tax, or you may not have been required to make estimated tax payments. and so. I just point that out to, to kind of, it, it would be good to go back and kind of look at each activity that you have. One of the big things that we discussed internally, and I, Amanda, I don't know if you want to chime in on this, but that we see that we're kind of waiting for more guidance on is how um, clients with multiple K-1s from alternative investments, how that is going to be um, triggered. I know we are hoping that we're going to be able to treat a lot of those activities as one trade or business and that since it's just a standalone investment activity, but we still have not seen um, clear guidance on what that's going to look like and how we're going to track that. That could have some pretty significant implications for nonprofit organizations that generate unrelated business income from alternative investments, uh, where historically you may have you know a handful that are um, throwing off some significant unrelated business income, but you've got a lot that may be throwing off losses that you're using kind of to net against other operational activities. So you know it's a good idea now. I know as we go through and prepare our clients' tax returns, we're trying to identify which activities are generating income, just to kind of prepare clients to say, hey, um, you might need to, to budget for this. You may need to kind of start getting this on your board's radar if they're used to the fact that you may, that they may not even realize you're filing the 990T, but if you suddenly have a change in your taxable income amount, um, just that that's kind of not a, a surprise to, to the board or to other um, you know, people in your finance department who may be looking at some of this stuff. And then also to consider the change in the rate implications for clients that have historically been in lower tax rates. Maybe you had some unrelated business tax income, but it was in a low tax bracket. Uh, we want to take into account the fact that you're now looking, you know, if you were in the 15% tax bracket, you've got a 6% rate increase. And then also for clients who have been in the highest marginal corporate tax rate, you know, you're going to get a good break from this, dropping into the 21% tax bracket. But you just want to be looking at those activities to make sure um, when you look at your expense allocations, you know, are you capturing that on an activity by activity basis for some activities? It's just going to require a little bit more thorough review of your unrelated business activities. I know Amanda and I had talked about that internally and just wanted to, to take point on that. And then also as we wait for state guidance, we're still waiting to see how, you know, what state you operate in, how are the states going to conform to some of that activity. So it, it's just an interesting um, time right now to look at some of this stuff to see how it's actually going to, to fall out and how we're going to track this um, activity. You know, it, it's going to be more of a compliance cost to have to track loss carry forwards by activity and, and things along those lines. So it definitely has made reporting a lot more involved. Amanda, I don't know if you have anything to add. 
Yes, Rachel, those are all good points. Thank you. There is one other thing that I would like to mention, which is that un unrelated business taxable income includes income from property subject to acquisition indebtedness. So that means that income that essentially is from an investment and not really related to a trade or business, nevertheless, is considered unrelated business taxable income. So I'm not certain how that is going to factor into this segregation of activities, whether all uh, debt financed activities can be combined or whether they will need to be segregated. Because a lot of times, they, you know, K-1s, sometimes the UBTI that they show is from a business activity, but sometimes it's from leveraged assets inside an investment partnership. And so normally, um, you know, that would just be passive investment income except for the extraordinary rule that, you know, unrelated debt financed income is taxed. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what comes of that. I think the issue is that due to budget constraints, the IRS is limited um, in how it can approach putting out new guidance in the form of regulations, et cetera, to help all of us understand how to apply the new rules. And they've already stated that they have to prioritize those items that affect the most taxpayers. So it may be some time before we actually see any regulations defining how to track the unrelated business taxable activities and the impact on debt financed income. Yeah, and I, I would say also with respect to the having to track these activities on an activity by activity basis, while it's new in a regulation standpoint, it's not necessarily new from an examination standpoint that what we have seen historically on under examination is that the, IRA, the agents were already questioning, you know, if you had a loss activity, they were already trying to um, pull that off the table, usually trying to argue on a, that there was a lack of profit motive for continuous losses. But it's basically getting us to the point where we have it now in codified how it's going to be treated versus what we were having to deal with on the fly from an examination standpoint as to what agents were kind of pushing on examination. And then I'll go ahead and move into the next section. There were, there were just some other random items that came into play that affected nonprofits, and so we'll just touch base on these somewhat briefly. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk in the tax-exempt bond world that, you know, as we had different, we had the House version and we had the Senate version, and we had all these different changes going back and forth between those versions and what they were going to look like. So for the last quarter of 2017, it was kind of a, you, know, you would read one thing, you know, in one version and see something else, and then what came out in the final bill. So it got, you know, a little bit confusing because there was so much on the table and, and the changes that came about as a result of the final bill. But private activity bonds had been on the, the hit list at one point to kind of, you know, consider even doing away with that. There was a lot of lobbying in that regard, so they kind of stayed safe off the table. But one thing that did um, come into play on taxes and bond financing was that um, historically you could do what's called an advance refunding on a bond. And basically that's just a financing technique that you can use that allows the issuer to obtain the benefit of a lower interest rate. But um, you do this when the outstanding bonds aren't currently callable. And so there's limited times that you can even do this and how many, I think you can only maybe do it one time anyway as far as the advance refunding. But historically, the interest that you earned on that because you had basically this rate differential that you could take advantage of because of swing in interest rates, that it would be non-taxable, just passive income. Well, with the new legislation, what they've come out and said is that if you have an advance refunding, that exclusion on the interest income of that bond um, is no longer going to be excluded. It would be taxable um, to the nonprofit organization. And then you can see there the effective date that this comes into play. So you can still do a refunding of bonds. That current ability to do a bond refund is going to remain in place. It's just, it's just if you're going to look to do an advance refunding. Um, so if you had something like that that came into play, you know, you might want to talk to your bond counsel on that. So it's just kind of a, a point to note. Now, th this slide, this is the 1.4% tax on educational institutions. This had been batted around for se several years. Um, I don't know how many times in different updates we've talked about the tax on endowments. I think a lot of people are still referring to this as an endowment tax. It's, it's not really quite an endowment tax, as it could potentially target other investment assets outside of your endowment because it's really looking at organizations' net investment income. But thankfully, in the final bill, 
the way the, the mechanics of the text, the, the thresholds were changed, it basically took a lot of schools off the table that could have been hit by this. Um, it's interesting that they now have it on the table. I've sat in on several calls and, and different um, things for, you know, the National Council on Nonprofits, different organizations um, that are looking at this to say, okay, well, now we've got this tax on the table. You know, the fear is, okay, as we, as we move down the road, is it going to, you know, are they going to start changing the limits so that it applies to more organizations? You know, who knows? But under the, the current one, it's, this is only going to apply to the really big, for the most part, really large organizations, you know, your, your Harvard and your Yale and your Princeton that have pretty sizable endowments. But it's just going to tax their net investment income. It did, does exclude state colleges and universities. And the, the rules basically require that you have at least 500 students and that when you look at your um, non-exempt use assets that divided by the, your total number of students, if you have more assets at a 500,000 per student value, you could trigger the tax. But there's a, there's a lot of confusion on what this is going to look like because you don't include basically program-related assets in the calculation. And so schools are going to have to go through and figure out, okay, what, what are program-related assets? And then also trying to get a, a handle on what is their um, net investment income from a tax basis versus, you know, a gap basis is going to be um, interesting on, on some different, like maybe alternative investments where you're having to track like a tax basis number that you may not have in the past. So um, for the schools that this applies to, it, it's going to be quite a headache. But like I said, thankfully, I think there are about 30 institutions that they originally uh, or that are now going to, this is going to apply to on, on this first year rollout. Over the next couple of years, I think some more organizations might fall into this. But for now, we're, we're looking at a pretty small segment of the tax exempt sector that's going to get hit with this. Um, there were also provisions that changed um, your ability to use Section 529 plans. So for those of you, for, for those who have, you know, K through 12 private schools, this is good for um, your families at your school, and then also for if anybody has, you know, kids that are in private school right now. Basically, the 529 plan option allows you to put money in a tax-deferred account, and you can have that money earn interest and things like that, and the earnings on that are tax-deferred as long as you use the distributions from that account for qualified tuition, and um, it, would, it would apply to the college level, so it was qualified tuition, room and board is what it's historically been. With the new changes in the, the Tax Reform Act, it now can apply to um, K through 12 education. So if you have your child in a private school, you could put money in a 529 plan and start setting that aside and then use those um, distributions from the 529 plan on a pre-tax basis to help pay for um, the tuition. Or, uh, let me rephrase that. You could, the earnings on that that are earned in that account, you would get the benefit of tax-free earnings. And then when you pull the distributions out, you could use them if you used it for qualified expenses. Um, in the short run, you know, for people funding it, you know, this next year, it's not going to be a big federal tax benefit because there's probably not going to be substantial earnings in the fund that are saving you a whole lot on the income earned on those assets. But from a state planning perspective, you may be able to get the benefit um, of a state tax deduction. I know in South Carolina, if you make um, donations to a 529 plan, they're deductible, um, I believe, fully for your state personal income taxes. And so different states have different rules. And it depends on, you know, some states will only allow you a state tax deduction if you contribute to the state 529 plan. But just something to know that it's out there um, as you take into account you know, you know, if you've got, like I said, if you've got children who can use this or if you're an institution that has K-12 students, you might want to make that um, information available and just consider that also as you're going through an awarding financial aid. That might be a new um, metric as you, as you give out financial aid to know whether or not the families that you're dealing with already have 529 plans set up for their children. And Amanda, I think it's over to you. All right, thank you, Rachel. So many organizations, I believe, have already started looking at the first suggested next step, which is reviewing your donor base, your con contribution plans. You know, how are you approaching um, your donors to determine whether you need to revise or change your giving campaigns? Um, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the concern that removal of tax deductibility for charitable contributions will greatly impact contributions to exempt organizations. But I'm sure you know that a tax deduction is not the only motivation 
for every donor. Um, in fact, you know, in 2001, Independent Sector, which is a nonprofit organization focused on charitable giving, they found that households earning less than $25,000 a year gave away an average of 4.2% of their income, while those with earnings of more than $75,000 gave away only 2.7%. This situation is perplexing if you think of it just in terms of dollars and cents. The poor, you would assume, don't have resources to spare, and the personal sacrifice of giving is disproportionately large, whereas the rich do have money to spend. Those who itemize as long as you know, they're in compliance with the new tax rules, may receive you know, a tax break for making charitable donations. And Americans do pride themselves on their philanthropic tradition and on the role of private charity, which is much more developed here than it is in other countries where the expectation is that the government will care for the poor. A research study from 2010 found that lower income people were more generous, charitable, trusting, and helpful to others than were those with more wealth. They were more attuned to the needs of others and more committed generally to the values of egalitarianism. Empathy and compassion appeared to be the key ingredients in the greater generosity of those with lower incomes. The study found that if higher income people were instructed to imagine themselves as lower class, they actually became more charitable. If they were primed by, say, watching a sympathy eliciting video, they became more helpful to others, so much so, in fact, that the difference between their behavior and that of the low income subjects disappeared. Essentially, what this might be saying is that you may change the way you approach soliciting contributions from donors, focusing on the impact that the organization's operations will have in serving a charitable class that it works with, and that may be a way to increase giving despite the lack of having a, a charitable tax deduction. The next thing to consider is looking at your compensation arrangements, if it's possible that the new 21% tax on excessive compensation would be relevant to your organization, as well as if you provide any of the new benefits that we, any of the benefits that we talked about earlier that are now not deductible to for-profit employers and could create unrelated business taxable income for nonprofit employers. And lastly, in the unrelated business taxable income arena, you'll want to consider changes to accounting systems needed to track UBTI back by activity. And it's going to require some thought about the activities and the impact of how the activities are defined and the reporting on 990T. Disaggregation of business units when required is likely to expose separate activities with recurring losses to greater scrutiny regarding profit motive, which may further limit an organization's ability to realize a benefit from current and prior year net operating losses. Pending authoritative guidance, organizations should review and group UBI activities carefully and be ready to defend aggregation of activities when necessary based on reasonable application of the factors previously discussed, taking into account commercial practices for similar endeavors. Accurate records substantiating current and carry forward net operating loss deductions for each activity must be maintained. Methods for allocating costs among activities must be reasonable and consistently applied. So now, not only do we have to carefully allocate expenses between related and unrelated activities, you also have to be sure that you can correctly allocate the unrelated business expenses to each activity to which they apply. Operating UBI activities through a wholly owned for-profit subsidiary may be a viable alternative where activities with recurring losses demonstrate the requisite profit motive. Expert advice should be sought before pursuing this type of arrangement. Taken together, these actions will help organizations manage UBTI liability under the new law and reduce the likelihood of unexpected and costly assessments of income taxes. Finally, I know we've had a number of questions in the question pod, and we all have also provided some answers. But for those um, who may have not gotten their question answered, um, or so that all can benefit from an explanation of the question and answer, uh, we have some time now, and I'd like to address some of these questions. There were a number of questions regarding the qualified transportation fringe and the impact of 
uh, whether if the not-for-profit has an arrangement whereby the employee defers a portion of their salary um, to pay for those qualified transportation expenses, and that amount is treated as pre-tax. So that, the ability to do that pre-tax is under Code Section 132, which has not been impacted by the new act. However, it does seem like kind of a loophole um, because to get around the non-deductibility of a for-profit employer or the treatment as UBTI for a, a non-profit employer for paying such expenses, it would be easy to just increase people's salary, still allow them to treat it as a pre-tax deduction, and then it, there would be no UBTI or lack of deduction. Um, but I believe it is a gray area. It is something that you know we're actively seeking additional guidance on uh, because it's not clear as to whether um, there's any impact to treating those amount pre-tax on not-for-profit employers and whether that needs to be treated as unrelated business taxable income. And Amanda, that is a big question in the for-profit uh, mm -hmm. uh, community as well. Everyone's trying to scramble to figure out uh, exactly what these definitions are, what it means, and how can uh, compensate? How can um, benefits and compensations be arranged to uh, to meet everyone's needs? Mm -hmm. uh, next question has to do with um, the mention I had made about whether contributions that were deemed to be connected to um, getting the right to purchase tickets to athletic events, um, whether there would be sales tax imposed on those and a Essentially, the point is that if the amount paid is deemed not to be a tax deductible contribution because it's related to the right to acquire tickets, that it's possible for sales tax purposes, those amounts would be treated essentially the same as amounts actually paid to purchase tickets. Um, so that's kind of an unknown that may depend on, as Rachel alluded to earlier, how this, the states address changes in the tax law. Okay, let's see. Next question is um, whether employer paid em uh, moving expenses um, on behalf of an employee would be reported on a 990T as unrelated business income. So that type of employee benefit was not included as the, one of the types that would be taxable uh, unrelated business income to a nonprofit. Essentially what has happened is that the, um, that amount is not allowed to be excluded from the employee's income, and so it would be deemed to be taxable wages, and so would be reported on the employee's W-2 uh, along with their other wages. Next question, what if your employer pays part of your Y fees? Will that become taxable? So the exclusion referred to um, from taxable income was for employer-provided athletic facilities. So that exclusion was when an employer actually had an athletic facility on premises that was exclusively for the use of employees and allowed them to use that. Um, and so there was not an exclusion for paying for health club dues. So if the YMCA dues are deemed to be equivalent to health club dues, then that would there would not be any change under the current law that would be a taxable benefit. Let's see, next question has to do with the employer provided service awards. And that one was kind of interesting because it was deemed to just be a clarification of the existing rules as opposed to being a, a really significant change. But it was just a reminder that when you provide certain types of gifts to employees, such as cash and cash equivalents like gift cards, that those are taxable. It has to be a, a tangible item. So having so where people can collect, uh, someone mentioned about points, but if you can collect points that can be used to acquire a tangible item uh, through a selection, through a catalog or something, then uh, that that's all right, but because you can only use it to spend on certain tangible items. That, that still permitted that kind of flexibility. I should say appears because <laughs> a lot of the new tax law uh, is still indefinite. Okay, in the area having to do with 
separating business activities and net operating losses. Just wanted to um, reiterate one thing about the, the change in net operating losses, which is, so going forward, net operating losses will be tracked by activity. Um, and so net operating losses in one activity will only be allowed to offset future net unrelated business income from that activity going forward. That's effective for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017. But for net operating losses from prior years, those will be deductible in full against all activities and won't be subject to the 80% threshold. So that's going to be another you know, thing just to, to watch out for is you know, identifying net operating losses occurring prior to the change um, and then going forward allocate tracking income expenses and net operating losses by activity. What the IRS has tried to do is to eliminate what happened, what they discovered in their college and universities compliance project, which was that organizations were offsetting net operating losses from trades or businesses that didn't have a profit motive. So now, although tracking the profit motive is important, when you're combining activities, because everything is isolated, that limits the chance that you could be taking a loss from a, a non-business activity against a business activity. All right. Also in the unrelated business taxable income section, the questions about whether income and losses flowing through K-1s from private partnership investments would be considered one activity or multiple activities. Again, that's a very good question. We're not sure yet if organizations will be required to identify the activities carried on by each partnership in which it is invested and to group activities similarly. Um, also, in terms of income coming from debt financed property, whether that will all be considered to be one activity or would need to be separated, that's just an unknown at this time. And one last question about the new tax on educational institutions. The question is, does the state college university exclusion apply to a related university foundation? Or are associated foundations not subject to this section? The way I understand it, the tax is on the educational institution itself. And state college and universities are not considered to be in that definition of educational institutions that would be subject to it. Now, in determining the calculation of the tax, you look at assets held by related foundations, but the tax is actually imposed at the college level, um, looking at the assets held by the foundation. And with that, I believe we're at the end of our time for today. Um, we're going to, sh I believe, Sarah, we're going to share the um, questions and answers with the audience at a later date? That's right. We will, we will have a, a, a copy of Make This um, Session available by uh, a video recording, and we'll send you guys all a link. So if there are others in your organization that could not participate today, or those on your board that you would like to uh, view this and, and become engaged and informed, we'll have that available to you as well. Uh, like, as uh, was mentioned by both Rachel and Amanda, there's a lot of things we don't know about this, but we wanted to get some about this new law. We wanted to get you the information we do have at the moment, uh, and you guys are all asking the right questions. It is there are, is a lot to digest, and many definitions and guidance that we would really like to get from the IRS to help us with this. So uh, thank you very much, and we will look forward to connecting with you again uh, later on. So thank you all for attending.